Hi, I'm Mike Scott, volunteer at the Old Low Light. On the 23rd of June, 1864, the residents of North Shields witnessed the greatest celebration and outpouring of joy that has possibly never been equal since in the town. A great procession wound its way under the banners from Railway Street through the principal streets of the town. With flags flying, church bells ringing, brass bands playing and cannon booming, the superintendent of police led all the mayors of Tyneside, the Tyne commissioners, the Duke of Northumberland's commissioner, consuls and vice-consuls of many foreign powers and hundreds of townsfolk towards the Black Middens. It was arranged that 4,000 school children were to assemble at the town hall and march to Mr Barker's field where they were to be fed before moving on to the cricket field in Preston Road for fun and games. Why the celebrations? The laying of the foundation stone of Time Mouth or Low Light Dock had been a very long time coming. Twenty years before, in 1845, Mr Brooke, architect and engineer, had designed a dock for Newcastle Corporation, the then River Conservators, below Percy Square, where Knott's Flats now stand. From the start there was much arguing and wrangling about location and finances between different political parties, town councils on both sides of the, of the river, the Tyne Commissioners, mine owners and ship owners. Eventually an Act of Parliament was passed on the 28th of June 1861, stating that work had to commence within three years at an estimated cost of £450,000. So, just five days short of the deadline, a great congregation of people assembled on the very tip of the Black Middens to witness the laying of the foundation stone by Mr Joseph Cowan, Chairman of the Tyne Improvement Commission. Despite the torrential rain, a, her a hermetically sealed bottle containing copies of four newspapers and coins of the realm was placed in a cavity topped by an engraved brass plaque under the topmost stone. Following the ceremony, A-list guests retired to the Albion Assembly Rooms for a grand banquet, while the B-list went to the Commercial Hotel in Howard Street. Sadly, the children's procession was abandoned because of the rain, with food being consumed in school and the sports taking place later in the week. Having read an article about the proposed dock written in 1905 by Horatio Adamson, I was determined to find the abandoned foundation stone with its bottle and plaque. The harbour master had no idea where it was and said that he didn't relish plodging for it. The port of Tyne Severe was more helpful and supplied me with a chart showing its position. One Saturday, when the tide was at its lowest level, Martin Kenny and I ventured out to the extreme end of the middens, where we found the stone, or stones, as described by Adamson. No progress had been made with the construction of the dock, so the stones had stood neglected until they were hit by S.S. Stagshaw in 1878, displacing the upper stones. The salvager of the wrecked ship took a portion of the bottle, the newspapers and the plaque. We could see the topple stones and where the bottle and the plaque had been. The stone is visible at low tide using binoculars from the view viewing platform of the old low light. My next quest was to find the brass plaque. In 1905, Adamson stated that it had passed through several hands and that it was probably with the Tyne commissioners. My inquiries at the Port of Tyne and at Blandford Street Discovery Museum drew a blank. However, I did find the box containing the trowel and the other tools used at the laying of the foundation stone in storage at the Laying Art Gallery in Newcastle. 
The mahogany box with an engraved silver plaque contains a trowel, two mallets, a rule, spirit level and a square with plumb bob all bearing silver engraved labels. The art gallery had no idea how it had come to be there or what it was or what it had been used for. They know now. The dock was never constructed for a number of reasons. At the time of the laying of the foundation stone the piers were only partially built and the proposed location would have been vulnerable to storms. Shortly after the laying of the stone there were a number of shipwrecks including that of the Stanley which confirmed the long-standing worries of some mariners. There were many financial problems raised by Parliament by the mine owners who planned to ship their coals from the dock and by the local councils involved. There were difficulties finding a good route for the rail link to the dock, so the Blythe and Tyne Railway withdrew their support. Numerous high-powered inquiries, one involving Isambard Kingdom Brunel and Captain Robert Fitzroy, dragged on and on, until eventually they decided that Coble Dean was a more sheltered and accessible place to build a dock. <laughs>